questions. Okay. So I want to welcome everybody and thank you for coming to our second annual ArtU event um, for teens interested in a career in the arts. Um, this is the second year we've done it. Uh, last year, we also had to do a, a virtual version um, due to COVID, but uh, we are super happy um, that you all can make it. Um, eventually, maybe this event will be held in person um, so that we can have some more hands-on stuff and um, get some more actual networking happening and, and different organizations um, to table and have stuff for y'all to do. But for now, this is, this is what we can do. And so um, what this, this event is, is um, part of our new teen program, um, Works in Progress, which is a artist professional development program. Um, so teens from 15 to 19 can apply to the program. Um, and it's all about careers in the arts um, and what you need to have in order to be a successful artist, such as you know your portfolio um, or a reel if you're a filmmaker or headshots if you're an actor, you know all that great stuff. Um, artist statements um, and then talking about you know a college path um, or an internship, all those different things. Um, and so if you are a teen and you're interested, um, we will start that program again next year. We are just wrapping it up. Um, we've got a couple, couple uh, teens in here that took the class this year. Um, and so uh, they were our pilot year <laughs> and um, we were able to do a lot of things or as much as we could virtually. Um, and we had a great time. They learned a lot. And so um, I will put the link to that webpage about that program um, in the chat. And um, it's austintexas.gov slash works in progress. Uh, works is plural. Um, and uh, if you're interested and maybe looking at taking it next year, um, there's a, a link on there that you could sign up uh, to get some more information and have us reach out when the applications are available next fall. Um, so anyway, this, this uh, event, they, our teens from this round help, helped us plan and coming up with what kind of artists they wanted to hear from. Um, and so they talked about wanting to hear from a mural artist. And so we've got Helena Martin, um, and an illustrator, Kyle Armstrong, um, an architect, um, Mai Gutierrez, who will be here in a little bit, and then a performing artist, uh, Kelly Hassandra. So we're gonna hear from all those guys as we go through the day. Uh, <laughs> Kelly's doing a little happy dance. And so um, we're gonna start off with Helena and let me get things switched around here. Get you spotlight. There we go. All right. Take it away. Cool. Hey, everyone. My name's Helena. I'm a mural artist um, here in Austin. I'm based in Austin, but I've painted all over the world. Um, and I'm so I'm going to just tell you a little bit about my story and like how I got to where I was and like some, what are the, some of the obstacles I had and some of the like self doubts and just all the things that come with that because I really wish that when I was a teenager someone had done this for me. <laughs> so I've got a little presentation. I don't have any demos or anything since I do big murals, but I've got a couple videos. So I'll talk for a while and then I hope that if you all have any questions, um, we can have some Q and A um, at near the end. So let's see here. All right. Okay, is this working? Can you all see a big cat? Yeah, okay, great. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm sorry, this is my favorite mural. It's in um, South Austin on Old Torf in Congress next to the Starbucks. So I always like to start off with this one. So this is just um, an example of some of my work. This is an old church's chicken, which is like a fast food place. Um, and the client um, had me paint over it because it was getting a lot of graffiti on it. So they had, they commissioned me to do this piece. Um, okay, so here's a picture of me in action. Um, I actually have a bachelor's in science in biology and a master's in science in medical illustration. And I use neither degree. <laughs> um, 
uh, we can get into that. I'll get into that a little bit more later, but um, I did feel a lot of pressure when I was a teenager to um, kind of follow a certain path, like with acad academics. And I'm not saying that academics are a bad thing, but um, I just, I noticed that back then I was kind of doing what I thought I should do and I, what I thought I would make my parents happy when really all I really liked to do was like doodle and draw and paint. And um, so I kind of spent a lot, I don't want to say wasted, but I spent a lot of time doing other things. So I got this whole, all these other degrees um, before I decided I wanted to be an artist. Um, and that all started with me um, being in a place in my life. I was working at an animation studio, which seems very fun and cool, but it was actually not very fun for me um, because I just didn't like what I was doing. Animation is very tedious. Um, so I felt like I didn't, and it was part of this big studio, so I couldn't really express myself. So I didn't feel like I had a voice and I was kind of frustrated and angry about that. So I started doing graffiti. Um, and I also just wanted to be cool and edgy. So I grew these dreadlocks. Um, I started painting graffiti. I really sucked at first. <laughs> this is some of my first stuff. Um, you can see it started to get better. And then I got pretty good. Um, like in, as far as like graffiti goes, I graduated um, past being called a toy um, and I got arrested and I realized, you know, maybe this isn't the right thing to do, you know, like vandalizing property. Um, you know, it was, I, was, I was going to a lot of like abandoned factories and tunnels and stuff that no one used or anything, but I, I did realize what I was doing was kind of, I was feeling like no one noticed me and I just wanted to Stuff. So it kind of like me to change my life. And so I moved to Austin and I decided I'm going to just quit my job. Like we were talking about earlier. And um, I moved to Austin and I freelance animated and I started painting um, at the graffiti park. And again, I felt like I had to be edgy and cool. So I was painting all this stuff with like, um, because spirit animal and just it's got to be all trippy and um you know there's nothing wrong with these pieces but um I finally just started painting what I really wanted to paint which is pretty birds and flowers and you know just things that were kind of softer graffiti is so hard and harsh and you got to be tough and act tough all the time and I really am not like that um, <laughs> and so I just kind of embraced more of what I wanted to do so I started painting stuff like this. I was really poor. Um, I didn't have a car. I was riding the bus with my ladder and stuff, but I just started picking up little jobs here and there painting. I was still freelancing animate, animating um, and things just started to build for me. So eventually, so that, so I quit my job in 2013 and then I was painting all the spirit animals for a few years and I was still doing graffiti a little bit, but my heart wasn't in it. And then 2017, I painted this piece. Um, this is by the Alamo Draft House on South Lamar. Um, and this was like, there's nothing hard or edgy about this. It's like a big longhorn, right? But I just love this piece because it just felt like me. And I, um, it was my first holiday. I spent the Christmas alone here in Austin. And it was just, but it was just so much fun. It wasn't a sad time. I mean, there was like, emotions there, but it was a fun time. Um, and I have a video of me painting it. it. just shows how much fun I was having. The girl them skill our trip. Thunderbirds. Some give it up. Some give it up. Some give it up to our girls. Five million and forty shots. The way the time pool, I want to be keeping you out. There's audio coming through. It is Yeah. 
how to use a can, a spray can, which is actually quite difficult to use from doing graffiti. So I thought, why can't I just use these skills that I learned graffiti to do murals? Oh, oops, yeah. Full screen. Yeah, so anyways, so I started doing that and I started getting bigger and bigger jobs. And eventually I was just able to like stop freelance animation and just work um, full time with murals. I guess like right after that Longhorn, that was kind of a big piece for me. And I just started painting what I liked, like these birds, like these goofy birds, um, you know, and there wasn't anything like edgy or new about it. It's just a bird, but I put my own twist on it, you know, in my own style on it. And um, I noticed that people started reacting differently to that because it was more honest. You know, and I was having more fun while I was painting it than I was painting the other stuff or painting the graffiti. When the graffiti, I was like scared and tense or like angry. And this stuff, I was relaxed and happy. And so it just started this like feedback loop between me and like the rest of the world where I started getting like a more positive response about my artwork and started being able to make a living. Um, yeah, and then, yeah, just... I realized I could just paint like all this really girly stuff and it would be okay. You know, <laughs> like I, I can't emphasize up to you guys like how much I wanted to be hard and tough. Like I had a like, wanted to paint, um, which is like this kind of wallpapery, florally feminine stuff. Um, oh yeah. Uh, yeah okay and I 
I, a lot of some people ask me if I do canvas work and the answer is like almost never. Um, I don't really like painting canvases. I like painting murals because anybody can enjoy a mural. I like so many homeless people have come up to me and been like, I enjoy your murals or I like hang out with your murals because they've got like good vibes. And like your rich man, poor man, anybody can view a mural as opposed to fine art and then a gallery, which is, um, it's a much smaller group of people that enjoy the work. Or if you sell a painting, you know, it's just the people who live in that house that get to enjoy it or just the people who visit a gallery. So I just really liked how inclusive murals were. And I really see public art or street art or urban art or whatever you want to call it. I see it as the newest art movement. Um, yeah, so I still think lettering's cool, even though I don't do graffiti and I still appreciate graffiti, but um, I can do lettering now that has more of a, like a positive, like impact or encouraging words. This is something I did for a yoga studio and um, uh, by, by ACC. Um, oh yeah. Yeah, and it's definitely a full-time job for me. I'm not alone. I have several colleagues who work full-time. Um, some people make way more money than me even. People are making six figures being a muralist. Um, it's just kind of exploding in popularity, the whole mural street art scene. Um, and I feel like there's less uncertainty than in fine art where you paint something and you hope that it'll sell. Whereas I work more as like a contractor where someone will hire me to paint something specific you know, when I've got some creative control too, and I just come and paint it and it's done, you know, like that Longhorn I painted in six days. When I would do canvases, sometimes it would take me six months to finish them. Um, and then I don't, you know, maybe they would sell, maybe they wouldn't, you know. Um, and not to crack on fine art, it's just, I find that I like the, the structure of the job of being a muralist more. I've gotten to work on really big projects. This is me down here in the of uh, Barton Springs it to be in these really cool boom lifts. I painted all over the world. I was in Australia for three months last year painting murals. I got locked down for a while during the pandemic, but it's because they raise property values. People is like a, yeah, it, it people enjoy it. They have, there's vibes that come off of the murals. Um, these are just some stats about it. Um, this is stuff I like sell to clients. Like you should get murals because people, people like them. It, um, it, there's this neighborhood in Chicago where they did, it was called Millennium Park where there's a bunch of street art and it's like generated over a billion in residential development. So that means like new buildings, new houses, new apartment complexes, that kind of thing. So um, yeah, um, so some of the obstacles I have, uh, it's not always easy, like, this is my favorite mural that I started with, um, Charlie, this is my cat, and, um, yeah, I mean, you get dissed, that's what they call it in the graffiti game, um, someone hit Charlie with a fire extinguisher, which is what makes these lines here, uh, he's been hit quite a few times, and I always go back and fix them, um, and um, as some people will see like muralists, like people who are in like graf the graffiti game and the street art game is like sellouts. And um, yeah, so I've had to deal with some of that, um, but I think it's totally worth it. Like I keep going back and fixing Charlie and um, yeah, I don't know. It just brings me so much joy. Um, oh yeah, yeah. And you can like, I just feel like before with graffiti, I was kind of, it was more vain. It was more just all about me. And now like when I'm painting murals, like it's more about spending positive messages to people about this one's about loving yourself, you know, and like people repost and you can tell that they're like really digging, digging the message, you know? So, yeah. Um, I've got a couple more videos, but I think I won't do this unless we, I only see if there's any questions first. I paint a lot with um, kids, y'all's age, like teenagers and then younger kids too, through this nonprofit I'm in mural project. Um, Oh, whoops. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, I think that the main thing I wanted to say is that to any young, do create the things that you like to do. Like if you want to just draw anime characters, draw anime characters. If you want to get, 
you know, if you just really want to paint cars, paint cars, because that's going to give you a lot more success than trying to do what you think other people will like. And I spent a decade of my life doing that by first like getting all these degrees that I wasn't really interested in. And then when I started finally painting, painting what I thought people would like. And um, I don't know, I just feel like if you guys can avoid that mistake, you'll probably be a lot happier um, overall. So yeah, and this is a piece I painted in uh, Los Angeles. And that's another thing cool this, about being a muralist is you get to travel a lot. Um, like I said, I've um, painted in Australia, Vietnam, and then all over the US as well. So, okay. So at this point, I wanted to see if anybody had any questions, Sarah, and then if not, we can watch a video. Um, sure, if anybody has any questions, feel free to unmute yourself, or if you're not comfortable doing that, you can also put it in the chat. Um, put it in the chat. Um, I have a question. Yeah, what's up? So, does it ever like, does it ever like, uh, like hurt your like confidence or something when somebody like tags your mural? Like, how do you find the motivation to like redo murals after something like that's happened? That's a really good question. It absolutely crushed my confidence. Like, I don't, I don't know what to do other than just going through the feelings. Like, I felt horrible I just cried and like raged out like why why are people doing this to me I've worked so hard to finally become a muralist and I did this mural and I'm so proud of it and someone just destroyed it like in minutes something that took me just so much time and effort and I've had people come and like like yell at me before at murals um yeah just I think just kind of going through that that yeah going through the emotions of like anger and then sadness and then you find like peace after that, you know, and you become hopeful again. So yeah, just kind of going through it. It never really worked for me to just like use my head and be like, it's okay. Those people are just haters. I had to like really feel like how much it hurt. Um, and so now like every time that Charlie gets tagged, it doesn't bother, it bothers me less, if that makes sense. Like the last time I got tagged, I was like, oh, he got tagged again. I better go back and paint it. It like didn't bother me at all. When the first time I was just like so upset, so. Yeah, just, I mean, that's, yeah, that's how I dealt with it. That's good. And I'm so sorry that that happens. That's like, I can't believe that people would even do that. Oh, yeah, it's no big deal. I mean, I get it because I was a graffiti artist. So it's kind of like, I was really jealous of people who are muralists when I was a graffiti artist. And I would call them sellouts because I realized I wanted to do that full time, but I didn't have enough self-worth to think that I actually could. And sometimes when you're jealous of people, you'll, you'll hate on them. And so I kind of understand why people would hate on me and destroy my stuff sometimes because it's like, they feel insecure. Um, but yeah, but yeah, thanks. Part of the game. Any other questions? Yeah, is anybody interested in doing murals, like painting murals, doing painting large scale? Oh, I should also say, because of medical illustration, I do have like um, training in drawing. Like I used to do kind of more like what Kyle does, like drawing really small and really precisely, because I used to draw like surgeries and stuff like that, where you have to be very precise. And um, so transitioning, so you're using like everything is in your wrist or maybe your elbow. And when you paint murals or graffiti, you're using like your whole arm. So like physically it's different. And it really kind of loosened me up because you can't get as much perfection as you can out of like drawing digitally or drawing on a piece of paper. So that helped me too, because I was kind of like, well, I still am, but I'm less so uptight as I used to be. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I guess, can you talk a little bit more about uh, the mural project and what you do with that? Yeah, so mural project, so it's just this nonprofit that I run with my friend, Jen, and we just provide mural workshops for kids. So K through 12. And basically we, um, we do a mural from A to Z with the kids. So you guys figure out like some sort of concept you want and then we help you paint it. And it's just really fun because as opposed to artwork that you make in art class and then your mom sticks it on the fridge for a week, 
a mural is up there for a long time, potentially, and every day you pass it, you can say, I was a part of that, you know? And it also helps kids to visualize being a muralist. You know, they can see me and Jen and they can think, I could be that someday if I wanted to, too. So really it's um, it's to give, give kids experiences with murals and to, you know, beautify areas because murals just provide instant beautification. Hopefully coming to Austin Parks and Rec soon. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, yeah, we um, we were slow during COVID, but we've got a workshop lined up this June, and yeah, see where it goes. Oh. Yeah, that's awesome. This looks great. Thanks. Yeah, I just want to thank everyone for listening, and um, for whoever asked that question, I'm assuming that was. I don't know who that was. I think it was Sophia and she's one of Sophia. our works in progress. Gracias. And yeah, if anybody um, has any questions, they can always DM me on Instagram. My handle is Helena underscore paints. It's on this, um, my screen. I'm always happy to like talk to young artists or people who aren't even artists. Um, you feel free to hit me up there. Awesome. Thanks so much. Uh, hey, Sarah, thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm going to remove your spotlight. Um, I'm going to throw up a poll here uh, while we are switching over to Kyle. Um, let me get the right one. All right. I'll let you guys take a look at that. And I, our next speaker is uh, Kyle Armstrong who's an illustrator and he actually also is one of our youth instructors at the Doherty, um, works with our after school program and summer camp. Hello. <laughs> Let's see here, this is gonna be interesting. I'm gonna be using two computers. Uh oh. <laughs> Always making it complicated. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm Kyle Armstrong. I am an illustrator. I'm a, I'm a digital illustrator. I do everything on computers. Um, let me find my presentation here. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, wait, that's not what I want. <laughs> Let's see here. Let's. Okay, can y'all see that? Yep. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm an illustrator, graphic artist, uh, and a tech rustler. Um, I I do lots and lots of stuff with computers and technology. Um, that's what I do for the Doherty Arts. I I teach digital arts to K through five. Um, so we're always finding new ways to make artwork with computers. Um, let's see here. How's this going to work? There we go. Uh, so here's like a scatter shot of things that I do. Because um, I, I don't know. There's <laughs> So something my, my dad told me, because my dad is an artist as well, is uh, when you take on a project, uh, just say yes and figure it out as you go um which is it's a double-edged sword um but uh it, it's been a good philosophy of just like getting your foot in the door and just like doing things um so i've made comics i've made artwork for t-shirts uh i've like made like rapid prototypes for like D, &D little figures uh i've made um kind of like small world building things for like community games, um, whole bunch of rando stuff. Um, but what, what does my education look like? Uh, I also have a degree in science, but it's like, mine is my university, uh, they didn't want to graduate anyone with art degrees because it doesn't look good on a university for like funding. There's more funding for science and engineering. So we all graduated with science degrees, even though everything that I took was, was an art class. 
Um, well, so, so when I went to university, uh, we studied things like color theory, sequential art, watercoloring, oil painting, um, all that kind of stuff. So I've, I've dabbled in a little bit of everything in the arts um, to get the kind of skills that I have now. Um, if you, this is, this is a timeline of uh, a little section of my life. If we look at it, um, <clears throat> I, um, I started out my career, um, designing for like a really tiny t-shirt shop, um, where, uh, I, I didn't necessarily do a lot of things that I wanted to do. It was a lot of what, uh, other people wanted to do, but what other people wanted was like zebra print on like text. So it was a lot of uh, that kind of weird kind of stuff. Uh, it, it was a lot of uh, stealing artwork from other people. Um, so I was very excited not to work there anymore uh, and to feel like I was doing my own stuff. Um, I also uh, I also did animation stuff. Um, I did e-cards when that was a thing, and I worked with Flash, um, which is all dead at this point. It's all unnecessary skills, um, but I did that for a long time. I uh, I sustained myself making a couple cards a month, and it was it was great. It was it was fun to um, learn the process of animation. Um, and from there, it was just it was a lot of uh, the that line of. Uh, illustrator and designer like you could break that up into like so many different things of what i've done um i've done um storyboarding i've done comics um i've done album artwork for bands um stickers and buttons and all those kinds of things um gone to conventions to sell my work um and then there's also uh being the uh digital uh instructor at the Doherty Art Centers. I've been doing that for quite a few years now. It's, it's crazy to think about how long I've been doing that. Um, so here's a, here's a selection of um, storyboarding and comics. So I've done um, storyboarding for Walmart and Sam's um, and Hallmark. Um, it, it's a lot of like um, trying to figure out commercials for them. So you're trying to get an overall feel of what the, the commercial will feel like and get the tone of it. Um, and then comics is, comics is a lot of fun. Uh, and I'm sure many of you have, have read and seen comics. Um, but it's, it's such an interesting, uh, different process to think about when you're making artwork because uh, you are doing the same thing over and 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 over again. So it's, it's getting really good at drawing characters uh, again and again, um, which is, it's, it's great for your artistic ability. Like you'll rapidly get better at drawing if you have to draw the same person over and over again. Uh, some other things that I do is character design. Um, and that's, that's what I love to do is, is designing characters, uh, designing things for worlds. I do a lot of world building. I play a lot of Dungeons and Dragons. Um, and a lot of things that I make is, is for campaigns. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll make these characters and you can put them in packs to put like on, on roll 20 so that other people can buy and use them. Um, so it's just like lots of little extra ways you can make cash off of the drawings that you make. Um, some other things I've talked about is, uh, making things for apparel. Um, so I've made, um, so even like, so like Helena was talking about where it's like, when you draw things that you love, like the, it's kind of like things just like come to you or whatever, like you start getting more work for the things that you love. So, uh, I loved world building and Dungeons and Dragons. So uh, people started to see that I was doing that. And so they contacted me to work on a line of t-shirts um, for Dungeons and Dragons classes. Um, and then I've done album artwork for a bunch of bands here in Austin. Um, there are always some real fun, goofy projects. 
Uh, but then, you know, what, what tools do I use as a, as a digital illustrator? Uh, so this is a, a selection. So I have, um, I've got a big old Cintiq uh, tablet that I use, um, which I, I just, I just got a new one. Uh, I had teeny tiny ones for, for a long time. Um, so that's like my, my giant drawing tool. I've got a, a Surface Pro that I use for like mobile drawing. So if I'm out and about, I can use that. Um, or if I'm like traveling, that's good too. Uh, so I don't have to lug around a whole desktop computer to draw. Uh, and then I, I use a, a, a PS3 motion controller for all of my shortcut keys. Um, so that way I don't have to carry a keyboard with me. Um, I've just rigged this thing to have like a whole bunch of buttons and like there's a brush and eraser, and then I can make things bigger and smaller. Um, all those kinds of things, but there are, there are so many different kinds of things that people use to draw. Um, I know so many people are moving over to the, the iPad at this point, just cause it's an all in one kind of device. Um, but like getting started, I, I use like, uh, the bamboo tablet. Um, so I just have a little tiny pen for, for drawing. Um, and there's also, uh, a, a couple people I know, they still use mice. To, to draw their illustrations in color. Um, I, I had a friend in college who was working, um, coloring for Marvel and they were doing all of their coloring with a mouse. And it was just incredible to see what they were doing with it. Uh, and what about programs? Um, so I use uh, Photoshop primarily for all of my illustrations. Um, I also use SketchUp if I'm going to, if I'm trying to figure out um, how something looks in 3D, I'll make like a, a rough model of that uh, object and I'll pull it into my Photoshop file and kind of just like align it to, to where I think it'll work. Um, and then a program called Lazy Nizumi, which is like, it, it helps uh, smooth out some of my lines, but it also helps with like, if I need to draw perfect circles, I can pull out the, the circle tool to help me do that quicker. Um, as opposed to trying to like do it over and over and over and over and over again. Um, but there, there are many great alternatives to Photoshop. Um, GIMP and Krita for one, those are free programs and they are both for PC and Mac. Um, if you have an iPad, Procreate, Procreate is like the new standard for creating. Um, and then there's also Clip Studio Paint, which is like focused primarily on uh, drawing tools um, as opposed to Photoshop, which is like, it's kind of a all together in one uh, kind of tool. Uh, and what does is, what is my workflow look like? Um, so I, I'll go through like how I go from like sketch to like finished product. Um, so I always start out uh, doing kind of like rough line work for my sketch. Um, I, I focus primarily on trying to get um, the shapes uh, reading correctly um, and that the figure is has like a defined silhouette. Um, after that, I'll do my, my clean artwork, um, working in layers, like in Photoshop, I can turn on and off layers so I can, uh, do my line work and then turn off my rough once I've done all of my lines. Uh, so once my lines are done, I'll, uh, I'll fill in with a, like a gray color. And this is just to like, help me separate and like, see the figure from the background. Um, and then I'll divide it up into the colors that will be like the, just the flat colors without any shading underneath. Uh, from there, I, I do my shadows. Um, so I use primarily purple for my shadows, um, but you can use any color you want really. Um, uh, but I just, I just like the way that that purple feels. Um, and I'll just do like, area selection, fill it with purple, and then kind of like blur it to get like the, the kind of effect that I want. Um, it's the same thing with the highlights. So if I'm using purple, I'll use a, uh, a complementary color. I'll use yellow for my, my highlights and do a, a similar process. 
Uh, from there, I, I do a bit of uh, texture um, just to give it a little more of like physical painterly kind of effect. Uh, so I, I have like some watercolor brushes that I'll use to give it uh, just a little bit of uh, impact. Uh, and then just like a, a shadow on the ground, just to give it like a, a feeling of like 3D depth. Um, and that's it. Uh, Y'all can ask me any questions. I can do uh, a demo, I guess. I could draw for a bit. Uh, you can tell me what to draw and I'll work on that. But I would love to answer any questions y'all have. Um, I have a question. Yeah. So um, I like one day want to become like a graphic illustrator um, or just some sort of like <laughs> like cartoonist or um, animator or something like that. Do you have any um, like suggestions for like art school or like specifically what to like major in or like do's or don'ts, things like that? Hmm. Um, I don't think there's any specific school that you should go to. Um, it's it's all I think it's it's mostly what you put into it is like what people usually say and I, and I think that is true um but anywhere that has um kind of like a a graphic design or a fine arts academy will will work um I find that um if you can find classes uh some of the most like important classes you can take is um design courses, uh, color theory, um, painting and drawing classes, um, just to get like all of those fundamentals like solid. Um, and then from there, I mean, it, it's all, you know, what is your personal style and you'll kind of figure that out for yourself. Um, but yeah, there's, there's so many fine schools. Like I, I know a whole bunch of people that have graduated from UT and they're some of the best artists I know um, but there are, there are also many artists that are kind of self-taught. Um, it is, it's just like, uh, it's drawing every day <laughs> or drawing most days, um, where you, you feel like you'll start to get like that kind of growth. Yeah. Um, thank you. So, thank you. Thank you so much. Absolutely. I actually have a question, Kyle. Yeah. Do you find that storyboarding in comic books are like really similar? Yeah, it's, they are very similar. Um, I think it, it just depends on, I think there's like a little bit less, um, especially with like the storyboards that I'm doing, there's like a little bit like less like fantasy and like action to it. A lot of it is like, Cause I'm not doing it for like movies or anything. It's like commercials. So it's like, this person walks into frame, this camera gets closer. So it's not like a lot of like, whoa, I'm here and now I'm gone. <laughs> kind of stuff you can do like in comics. Uh, but I think that's just like the storyboards that I'm doing, but they are like very similar feeling. Kyle, I know you said that like with the D and D, like the t-shirts, they contacted you, but how do mm -hmm. you go about getting a lot of your freelance work? Um, a lot of it is, um, it's, it's, it's kind of like word of mouth connections. Um, so I, I have, um, I have my Instagram and everything like that. Um, so there's people that follow me there. Uh, and it's like, it's, friends and friends of friends uh who who are who are looking for work um i also do um commissions as well so people can hire me to to draw pictures for them um so that's that's also a, a big part of um doing illustrations and then it's like every time you do one you know everyone's like oh cool i could get one of those too and so it, it kind of like chains together um as, as people see that you are doing those things. Um, there's also, uh, sometimes uh, you can see that like, like on Twitter, people are, are in need of somebody. Um, and then it's just kind of like reaching out and saying like, 
hey, I exist and I do these things. Um, I would like to do them for you. Um, and that's been, that's been helpful as well. Uh, I don't feel like there's like, uh, I'm not like, you know, some big illustrator, um, but I get by with like the, the work that I'm doing. Um, and it's, it's relatively consistent of just like people reaching out or like me having to, um, to say, Hey, I, I do artwork as well. All right. Does anybody have any uh, suggestions for Kyle of what he should maybe draw for us? <laughs> um, I have an, a suggestion. Yeah. Um, could you maybe do like an action pose, like somebody running or just something with like hands? Sure. Um, let me see here. Where am I? Uh, okay. Oh, um, Sarah, can you enable sharing for? Yep. Let me let me find it real quick. Yes. Okay, try that now. Thank you. Uh, let's see here. Uh, okay. All right. You can I see that? stuff here okay uh action pose okay <laughs> um one of the uh the bad habits that i have is i don't name my layers uh if you're doing digital art you should definitely name your layers um but i think it's just like i've gotten used to like knowing like where my layers are so i don't think about it but um when you start having documents that have like a hundred uh, layers, it'd be good to do that. Um, action, okay, let's see. Uh, I always start with like a head uh, and it's always like a circle, like figuring out um, top of the skull and things like that. Um, you know, and then it's like your, your cross to figure out your eyes and all that. So I still do that kind of stuff like you do um let's see here what should this person be doing they're running okay um so i have a request yes can they be holding like a sword or, like two swords two swords okay uh so possibly running with two swords this is very dangerous um let's see So some of it is like, uh, I'll do rough shapes to try to figure out kind of what I'm looking for. Um, and I can transform things to get better space. Let's pull this look out this way. See, if you have two swords, how are you going to run with two swords? Let's have, um, let's see, let's have one of his swords go behind him. And it's one of those things where it's like, it, it always starts out really rough and you're just kind of like building on top of it. Because one of the things that's great is, uh, besides now, most people will never see this. And then if I don't like the shape or the size of something, I can select it and I can transform it. So I want to make this head smaller. That's one of the hacks I've accepted uh, over the years, as opposed to erasing something and redrawing it. 
I'll just select a whole thing and move it. So like, if I don't like this, I don't really like this leg position. So instead of erasing it, I can kind of like move it out and then grab the back of this leg, pull it out this way. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, how do you keep from like, cause like I noticed a lot of the characters, you know, have like, uh, you know, like shapes in their designs. How do you uh, keep from like every character looking the same or having the same, you know, basic shapes for- Oh yeah, design? that's a very good question. Um, I, I think a lot of it is, um, some of it is, is like, I'll, I'll start uh, characters based on like scribbles. Um, that's like a great way to, to keep everything very different. Um, cause if I just do, you know, random shapes and then I've got to see what's in it, you know, if this becomes like a face, like this is kind of like a baboon face, but I didn't even like expect to do that. Um, so that's one way to do that. Um, but if like you're wanting to be like more controlled, um, it's, it's just like, um, it's kind of like being conscious of the, the shapes that you're drawing. Uh, and, and like, I'm still guilty of it too. Like I do a lot of characters that will probably feel the same when I look back at it. Um, but it's, it's, if you're doing like a line of characters, um, to, to think about their shape. Um, so like, if I do like, you know, tall character, I'll do, you know, a shorter character and then like a wider character. Um, so it's thinking about that shape language, um, breaking them up into B different kinds of shapes that way. Um, let's see, let me turn this down a little bit and then I'll do like a, maybe a slightly cleaner version of it so you can see it better. Um, let's see, my brush, my colors. Oh, so here's a, a hack uh, you might not learn usually. Uh, so my color palette, um, is all colors that I took from the screenshots of, uh, Steven universe and like gravity falls. Um, so if there's something that you love the colors of it, take it, do it, make it your thing. Uh, I think I've had this color palette for like a couple of years, uh, but I just like the, the kind of creaminess of these colors. This person is very happy to be running with swords. That's a little variety to what the sword shape looks like. Sort of behind them. So then because I've done it on layers, I can turn off my rough and I've kind of got this there. Um, yeah, so then it would go into color and I'll usually do a layer underneath to be my colors. Um, so that way, um, as an example, let me show you what you see here. So then I never have to worry about coloring on top of my lines and then I can always erase something. Uh, without affecting my lines. Uh, yeah, uh, any other questions? I'll close this out here. Uh, 
it is. I was over here. <laughs> All right, any last questions for Kyle? Oh, there's one. Um, how have you been able to learn proportions of body parts as an artist? Oh, yeah, um, it's uh, a lot of figure drawing and studying figures. Um, some of it is like you learn it and then you kind of distort it and forget it. Um, because when you're making kind of like cartoon characters, um, it's, it's good to know the basic idea of the proportions, but then it's like, how can you kind of alter it to make it different? Um, but um, doing figure drawing, even if you're doing things like, um, like tracing images helps a lot too. Um, if you if you trace on top of a figure, you can kind of see how um, the shapes interact together. Um, I found that to be really useful in in learning how to uh, the size of of body parts and things like that. All right. Um, oh, how long have you been drawing? A, a long time. Um, so my parents are artists. Um, so I started really, really early. Um, I, I'm probably the least rebellious child since I followed my parents doing exactly what they do. Um, so I've been doing it since I was, uh, I mean, probably regularly since I was like nine or 10, probably. Before that, I wanted to be a robotics engineer, so. All right, well, um, I think you had it up there, but Kyle, can you tell them like what your Instagram uh, oh, yeah. is in case they want to follow you? Uh, let me pull it up because it's, I don't know what the um, <laughs> the thingy thing is. Um, that's not what I want. Uh, let's see here. Where is my Zoom? There it is. Yeah, it's uh, at Kyle uh, under dash thingy Armstrong. Uh, it's basically Kyle Armstrong, but some other person has it. So I dropped my E and that's who I am now. <laughs> All right, awesome. Um, so yeah, thanks so much, Kyle. I'm gonna remove you right here. Um, I'm also gonna throw up another poll. Um, that y'all can do well. Um, we're transitioning to our next speaker, um, who is um, Mai Gutierrez, who is a architect and a sculptor. Let me find Mai. I let you in. Are you there? Oh, there you are. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> right here. Let me spotlight you. We'll give people a second to um, answer the poll. All right, interesting. A lot of people think everything of this is important, which is probably true. <laughs> All right, we'll give it just a few more seconds. I'm gonna end that. All right, so uh, we have our next speaker, Mai, and I will let you kind of introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do. Sure, uh, just wanna say thanks to Sarah and the Doherty Arts Center for having me. I'm uh, so excited to be able to share a little bit of my life with you guys. And congratulations to all the kids that are here because it's a Saturday and we all wanna be out doing fun stuff but that just proves to show that you guys are passionate. So kudos to that. Um, I'm just gonna do a quick intro of who I am, what it is that I do and how I got here. 
And then I'll share my screen and we can go through a construction document set and maybe a little, a little tour of Revit, which is the program that I use to uh, create models and drawings. Um, my name is Mai Gutierrez, as Sarah said. I was born and raised in Monterey, Mexico. I got my bachelor's in architecture at, from the Savannah College of Art and Design in 2009, and my master's also from SCAD in 2010. Uh, I remember being in high school and I was undecided about my major. I was, I wanted to get into the arts, but I was also very interested in psychology and I didn't know what to do. So I, I decided to spend my first year at Monterey Tech, just kind of, you know, figuring out what it is that I wanted to do, taking my core classes and, um, you know, just figuring life out. So I, I decided to, to stick with architecture. I was talking to a professor there and he's like, you just gotta stay in the arts. Like it's, it's don't go to science. This is what you're <laughs> good at, just, just stick to it. So I decided, okay, I'm, I'm gonna stick to architecture. I figured architecture would give me uh, a big avenue to where I could do different types of design and um, it just seemed like the best decision at the time. So I applied to SCAD. I had a bunch of friends that were going there and they all loved it. And, you know, it seemed like a lot of fun. I also wanted to leave my parents' house and become independent. So I applied and I got in. And, um, you know, a big, big suggestion is push for a scholarship because they'll give you a tiny little bitty scholarship, but if you are persistent and you keep asking, they will give you more. Like, don't, don't forget to ask for more because more than likely they will help you out. Um, and it was, it was great. It was, it was awesome going from like the weirdo art kid that was misunderstood to all of us were the weirdo art kids and we all had this big clan and it, it was awesome to feel like I, I fit in and I, I found my people. Um, so I started taking classes and, you know, the more architecture classes that I took, I, I realized what it actually requires. You know, in Mexico, you don't need to um, go to an accredited school and then, you know, have your three years of interning and then take the five exams before you're finally considered, you know, an architect. Uh, in Mexico, you just go to school, you graduate, you're an architect, that's it. And I was like, man, I didn't realize how much work this is. This is kind of like being a doctor, like this is nuts. And the more classes, the electives that I would take in say sculpting and uh, painting and drawing, I just thought like, this is way cooler. Like I would much rather be sculpting than, than sitting in front of a computer doing AutoCAD all day. Um, so I remember talking to my mom and I was like, mom, I wanna switch my major. And she thought I was crazy. She's like, you went all the way to the US to just study to become a, an artist? Like that's not gonna pay the bills. You're not gonna be able to make it. Um, so needless to say, I stuck with architecture and I was like, fine, I'll just, I'll, I'll graduate and then I'll be free from my parents and I'll be able to do whatever I want. Um, so I just, I kept going. I took a lot of electives in welding and blacksmithing. I did a lot of fashion design electives. So I still had a taste of the stuff that I liked while I did all my architecture classes. Um, finished my bachelor's and SCAD offered a, a master's that you could do in one year. So it was just one more year and I get a master's in architecture, then I'll be accredited. You know, I have a safety net if, if I ever do want to become an architect. So I decided to do it. I was already there, I had the scholarship and I really struggled. That, that year was hard because I, I was just burnt out. You know, SCAD was as awesome as it was and all the great professors and people that I met, it was still, it was a lot of work. It was a lot of long nights. It was, it was, it was a lot and I was tired. So when I finally finished my master's, I, I was like, that's it. 
That's it. I'm not going to be an architect. I'm not going to do this. I'm going to go find a job where I can work with my hands because that's what I'm good at and that's what I want to do. So I moved to Atlanta from Savannah. I found a job making glass beads for this jewelry company called Pandora. I went through the training and then I brought my torch and my kiln home and I set it up in my bedroom because I was sharing an apartment with somebody else. And I would sit there all day making glass beads. And, you know, it was, it was awesome. But I was also very isolated. I was just by myself all day. And I, I, I don't know, I felt like I needed some socialization. And I was making almost no money. Like I could not pay my bills. I was really struggling. I was like, man, okay, I need to supplement this with some other kind of income or I'm not going to make it. So I found a part-time job doing interior design for restaurants and food trucks. And it was actually kind of fun. Um, it was fun to pick out all the finishes and to talk to the clients who were opening a restaurant and learning about them and what it is that they needed and, and finding a way to make that, that space fit their needs. But I was in front of the computer. And that's not what I wanted to do. I, I did not want a desk job. So I went back to the jewelry world and worked for a jewelry designer making all of her, her jewelry. She would have visions, you know, and I would sit there and figure it out and make a necklace and, and then we'd, you know, take it from there. So that, that was fun. She was kind of a nut. She was kind of difficult to work for. So I was like, oh, I don't know. And I, I was far away from home and missing my family. And I thought, well, I wanna move closer to home, but not all the way back to Mexico. And one of my best friends was living in Austin and she said, hey, I need a roommate. Would you like to move here and move in with me? And I said, sure. So I packed all my stuff, uh, drove from Atlanta to Austin and immediately spent all the money that I had saved up and desperately needed a job. So I found a job with another jewelry designer here in town and um, spent some time just doing production, sitting there making bracelets, earrings, necklaces, all that kind of stuff. And after a while, you know, I, I, I came to, to know how the jewelry design business was and thought, you know, as much as I like making the jewelry, I, I don't know if this is for me. Like, I, I don't know that this is my world. I, I think I wanna get more hands-on and you know, do something more robust. So I got a job at a cabinet shop. Uh, I started as a miller. I was literally just milling down wood and it was awesome. It, I got to know all the tools. The people working there were really great. I had my little family and I just, I thought, okay, well, this is what I'm gonna do now. This is my new thing and I'm gonna be a cabinet maker. Um, so, after a while, and I loved it. It was it was really fun. I really liked being in a in a shop and sweating all day and and being tired at night and getting a good night's sleep. Um, so I remember I was visiting home one of those weekends, and one of my mom's friends. I was telling her what I did, and she's like, "Oh, I'm going to introduce you to this guy. He's awesome. He's a sculptor." And I thought, ah, you know, I I didn't have high expectations. I thought it was just going to be someone like me who didn't know what it is that they were doing. And I showed up to this guy's studio and it was freaking amazing. Like he had these giant sculptures, like 40 foot long, 20 foot tall out of steel and black marble. And I was like, oh my God, you can actually be an artist and make money and like have this amazing shop where you can build all these things. And it just opened my mind to what was possible so I spent a year with him. Uh, the first six months, I helped him with either, you know, CAD drawings or fabrication of the pieces, uh, anything that he needed help with. And then the second six months, months of my residency, he gave me materials and a place to work out of and lots of great advice. Um, but, you know, after that year was over, I had to come back to Austin and I went back to the cabinet shop um, started building cabinets and uh, I had an opportunity to move into the office and do estimating 
And I thought, sure, why not? I'll give it a try. Um, and estimating was probably the worst job I've ever had. It is not very fun. <laughs> it is a lot of entering data into Excel sheets. And that was it. That was my life. I just sit there all day. And I was like, man, so now I'm at a desk job. Like I'm doing the thing I didn't want to do, but I need the money. So might as well be doing architecture. Like if I'm going to be at a desk, I, it might as well be architecture. It's going to pay me more. So I got a job at Studio Stein Mummer, which I still work there part-time. Uh, I got a job with them full-time. And at the beginning, it was really rough because I felt like I had given up on the dream of being an artist. And I'm like, well, now I'm just, I'm going to get fat in front of the computer. And this is my life now. And you know, I, I really struggled, but the more I got to know what architecture really was like, the more I realized like, no, it is not just sitting at the computer drawing on AutoCAD. I get to go to construction sites and I get to work with engineers and other special, like mechanical engineers and structural engineers and people who have specialties in AV design. And I realized how all-encompassing architecture was and and I, I learned to love it in a weird way and I was like man I can't believe I never really gave it a shot until now um but I still I still wanted to work with my hands I still wanted to be in the shop like I I was craving that so badly um and I joined a group called Icosa we're a collective of artists we um all own a gallery and I have shows out of it and I started realizing, um, well, you know, maybe public art could be that perfect medium of the stuff that I love about architecture and the stuff that I love about working with my hands. Like that'll give me the opportunity to do both. So I decided I'm going to quit my job. I'm going to start my own studio and I'm going to do whatever I want, you know? So I, I walked in and I was like, hey, Studio Sign Mommer, I love you guys, but I got to go. And after, you know, I talked to them and, and we kind of negotiated that I'm going to stay for a while part time while I complete some of the projects that are in construction, um, which has been nice because I, you know, I get to keep benefits and stuff from from that company. But I also now get to start my own my own studio. Um, I'm building my shop. It's going to be an 1,100 square foot shop. We're in the process. The foundation's been laid. We're about to start uh, framing, and it's it's nice. I you know I get to pick and choose what projects I work on. I can work on architecture. I can work on interior design. I can work on cabinets or furniture. I can do public art, and and I think what I'm trying to get here is like you you don't need to have all the answers right now. Like you are just getting started and life is going to take you to many places and, you know, just try stuff out. See what happens. See if you like it. See, talk to people. Like what you're doing right now is great. Talking to people like all of us, it, it can give you a lot of insight on how it is in the real world and whether or not it is what you want to do. But, you know, just get out there and try some stuff and see what happens. Um, I'd be more than happy to talk to anybody. If you have particular questions, Sarah has my information and I would sit down, get a coffee, talk about anything. I'd be happy to. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen over here. I am going to walk you guys through a construction document set. There we go. So uh, construction documents is what we use to build buildings. It usually starts with a cover page like this. We have, come on, there we go. General notes that the contractor will use to uh, reference on what they need to do. For example, here we've got all the different types of materials that we, will be used in the project. Mm. Sorry, I forgot to mention, this project is going to be the future office for the firm that I work at. 
this is just showing all the different ADA requirements, which are very important in what we do in architecture. We want to make sure everybody can get around the building. Uh, site plan. A site plan shows the entire lot. It shows all the streets around it. It shows, you know, the parking lot over here, where your electrical meter is, where your electrical panel is, all sorts of good stuff. This over here is a protected tree um, that we cannot touch, and we have to make sure the building does not come close to the end of that canopy. Uh, let's see. Site plan, here's a floor plan. So this is showing every space of the building. Here's where you walk in. You've got your reception, a conference room over here. That's where our plotter and our printer will be. This is where all the desks will be in the office, restroom, and then you go upstairs to the second level. You got a break room, open office, another restroom, all sorts of fun stuff. And this, this is required by the city of Austin to get a permit. You have to give them all of these different drawings before you can even get started on construction. This is also a floor plan, but it is dimensioned. It shows all the different dimensions for every single wall, the location of all the windows, the doors. Um, and this is just something the contractor will use during construction. Same with the second level. This is a roof plan. So it's showing the roof, the slopes to where it's going to. You see this bubble right here. Um, whenever you submit something to the city of Austin, they'll give you comments and you have to resubmit. One of their comments was, hey, you need to show where future solar panels can be. So we threw that on there, bubbled it, and then resubmitted to the city. Um, what else do we have? This is a lighting plan. So this is, imagine you're looking up at the ceiling. So let's just focus on the conference room. Here are your switches. This switch controls all of these lights. That switch controls that light. And then over here, we've got what each of those lights mean. Um, you know, the manufacturer, all, all this information the contractor needs in order to install the right lights. Mm, doo -doo -doo. Power plan, similar. This shows all the different outlets. Here's a TV. Uh, some of these outlets have USB connection. This outlet is on the floor. This is all information that, um, that we need to show before we even start construction. This is showing the exterior of the building. These are called elevations. And we need to show all four sides of the building. Do, do, do. Our little sign made out of bricks. These are fun. These are interior elevations. So it's showing, here's an example of the bathroom, what it's gonna look like. Um, and then we have our schedule over here that shows like, oh, that's the color paint that we're gonna use, or that's the tile that we're gonna use. So there's a lot, a lot of information that goes into these drawings. Here, these are building sections. So imagine you're grabbing the building and you are slicing it in half and you're looking inside. And it's just showing, you know, where our floor trusses are, where our roof trusses are, and then we have even more detailed wall sections. So this is just looking through, oh, if you're grabbing a wall, you're cutting it in half and you're looking inside. So here's the roof and we're showing every single little piece of that wall. You know, the plywood that goes on the cap, the insulation, the headers, and all of this stuff has happened in conjunction with our structural engineer. They do a lot of the structure design. Um, here's the stairs in the building. I mean, I could go on and on with these drawings. There's so much information on them. Um, this are, are the, the windows in the front with the louvered curtain walls that go in front of it. Those will open up so that we can clean up the windows behind it. Mm. Let's see. 
These are details of the cabinets. Same thing, you're slicing through a cabinet and seeing what's inside. And we just show exactly what it is um, that we're specifying in the counters, you know, what type of pulls we're using. Lots of good stuff. This is showing every single window in the building. And then moving on after that, these are all the structural engineers drawings. So it's showing all of their information that the contractor needs to build. So let me share, this is the program that I use to draw. It's called Revit. And you're basically creating the 3D model in the computer. Come on over and you can spin it around and you can look inside. Here's all the drawings that we just went through over on this side. And what's cool about, nope, I don't need to save right now. What's cool about this, pro this program is you can cut through the building and see what's inside. So here's our conference room with our lights. It's our little reception area back there. We've been playing around with furniture. That's why there's like weird stuff everywhere, but you get the point. Doo -doo -doo. And I, I like this program quite a bit in comparison to AutoCAD. It's nice to be able to draw in 2D and have the program build it in 3D at the same time. So here's what we're looking at. That's all our desks where we're gonna be hanging out once this building is built. Um, yeah, so I figured I'd, I'd open it up to any questions that you guys may have. I know we've got about five minutes left. And if not, I can keep spinning this guy around. Um, how, how's it like drawing on the thing? It's, it's, you know, it takes a while to get used to, but it's pretty fun. Let's see, let's go to, let's go to floor plan level one. And let's say I want to draw a wall right here. So I go to architecture wall and I just do, do, do. Oh, there we go. And then I can change the type of the wall over here. That's a curtain wall. Let's say I want to do a big old big guy. So then when you go in 3D, and let me turn this section box off, you'll see here it is. This is the wall that we just drew. Wow. And I can move it over. So it's pretty, what I like about this is like, you're working in 2D and 3D at the same time. When in AutoCAD, you just draw everything in two dimension. So this is this is one of my favorite projects for sure. And then here, let's say um, I wanna add a door, you know, there we go. We've got a double flush panel. And then what if I wanna add a window? So you start, you know, building your little, world. Whoa. And then all of these little, so these right here, these components, they're called families. And you can download a lot of this stuff from the internet and just plop them into your model. So I don't have to sit there and actually model, you know, this, this chair. I just download this chair off the internet and plop it in my model. And it makes work a lot faster. Okay, so is this platform just for architects or is it for anyone? I think it's mostly used for architects, but I've, I've used this platform for some of my public art stuff. Um, so let me see if I can pull, pull it up here real quick. Yeah, well. Shoot, I guess I didn't save it. It's an open calls. There we go. So this this is our tempo project that uh, my partner Jonas Crisco and I are going to be working on in the summer, and it's going to be sitting at hopefully sitting at the Spicewood Library. But so that's our project. So I modeled all of these CMUs 
stuck them all together and then painted over them. So you can potentially use it for, for other stuff than just architecture. Um, wow. Yeah, it's really fun. So it's kids, so you got your little worlds and you can build stuff on here. You can, let me see, do I have any? Here's a credenza if we wanna have a credenza on there. I was hoping I had a, a person in here so you guys can kind of see the scale of this place, but I don't think I've loaded any people into this project. Twin bed. <laughs> You guys have any other any other questions? Yes, maybe. So, Mai, did you did you get awarded a tempo uh, yes. project? Yes, we awesome. did. Awesome, <laughs> very cool. So, um, if you all aren't aware, Austin has a um, division called Art in Public Places. And so any new building project uh, in within the city of Austin, so if it's like a, a government building um, or, or capital improvement project, so let's say they're going to do a, a redo a street, um, you know, 2% of that budget goes to public art. Um, it's, it's a mandatory thing. And so um, Art in Public Places facilitates those calls for artists. Um, and then they also have a program called Tempo, which is a temporary art project. So this is what Mai was working on um, with this project. And so that's, you get awarded um, up to $10,000 is generally the budget and um, you get to make your piece of art and install it. Usually they're doing it at libraries this year. They've done it at libraries, at parks around the city, um, all those kinds of things. Um, and so they, they do that almost every year if the budget is there to do it. And so it looks like we're doing it again. Uh, congratulations. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so that'll be fun. So yeah, uh, if you're interested in something like that, you can, uh, you can just Google Art in Public Places for Austin and take a look at their website. They've also got a great map that shows all the public art in Austin um, that you can go around and see at least the, the stuff that's been city funded. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much, Mai. Uh, thank you. I am going to remove your spotlight. I'm going to put up yet another poll um, while we get switched over to Kelly. Uh, let's see here. All right. So there's that. And let me get. Our next speaker is um, Kelly Hassandras, and she is a performing artist and also an educator. She works with TCTA, which I'm sure she'll talk about. So uh, Hello. We'll, give every, we'll give everybody a, a minute to kind yeah. of get settled and uh, yeah. take the poll. Take the poll, take the poll. <laughs> Are we gonna see the results of these polls? If I can figure out how to show them here, let's see. Yeah, right. <laughs> they look awesome. It looks really cool. Da, na, na, na. Uh -huh. Well, I'm just going to go ahead and start talking. Here, I'll sh there. Share results. Can you all see that? Oh. Practice, practice, practice. Yeah. <laughs> Get an internship. Yeah, this is great. Yes. All right, I'll close this. Let's see here. Uh, stop. There we go. All right. Take it away, Kelly. All right, my friends. I hope you're doing great. Uh, the last three speakers have, were amazing. I just really loved hearing their background stories and where they are now and um the arts here let me go ahead let me switch this i cannot i can see my lag is happening hello hello so um great my name is kelly hassandras 
and I um, am here to talk to you about the performing arts and in Austin specifically. That's where we live. That's where I work and um, where, you know, we're all thriving and especially in this crazy time in these weird times. Um, I'd like to I, I need to kind of know who's out there. If you feel comfortable, will you play a little game with me and turn your camera on? And if you don't feel comfortable turning your camera on, that's totally cool. But can you utilize this little those little reaction um, thingies at the bottom? Oh, things like that um, to help me get to. Hey, Jaden, that's my hey. boy. So yeah, Jaden is uh, totally cool, totally arter. And I know we've got some the and some uh, and the students that are part of the word works in progress group. So it's so cool that we're like we got some teens together that are really interested in being artists in the future. And I'm here to champion that. I think we're all here to champion that. And I'll tell you why. And we'll tell you. We'll talk about why. So give me a thumbs up. Keep your camera on if you are a visual artist. Mm hmm. If you are a, like um, painter, sculptor, visual artist. OK. Um, turn your turn your camera on or keep your camera on or do a signal. If you are a performing artist, if you like if you're a theater maker, dancer, musician. Juliet and Jaden, my yes, good. Um, Ray, keep your camera on. Raise your hand if you are, um, if you are, if you are an extrovert, meaning you don't mind being in front of people, talking to them. Um, you, it, it's fun for you. You like it. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Keep your camera on or turn your camera on if you're an introvert and you, find refuge in solitude, being by yourself with your art or with your thoughts, you know, on walks, you know, just that's where you recharge by yourself without the distraction of the outside world. Sweet. Yes, 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 yes. These are all, yeah, all good. Um, keep your camera on. Give me a thumbs up if you know that if you know what medium you want to pursue in the next few years like i'm definitely a painter i want to paint i'm definitely an animator i want to animate i'm a dancer i'm gonna be dancing what do you know and i don't mean like i don't mean like it can't change i just mean like what is your what's your jam you know your jam right now I have a few different ideas. So That's okay. It doesn't have to be one jam, but you know the jams. You okay. know the you know yep. the jams that you're jamming on. Yes. Jams, but there are a few jams. The jammy jams. Good, 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 good. Well, I didn't get a whole lot of reaction from Madison, Carrie, Teresa, Dan Danielle, Luden. But if you are, um, I'm hoping that you enjoy the arts and or maybe you're just listening and you're far away from your computer. Totally cool. Please use the chat to talk to me. Tell me anything. This talk is for you guys, you kiddos, you teens. And also, you know, and for me too, because I really love to share, you know, about the performing arts, about my process. I want to hear about your process. And I want to show you that it all is relevant. It's all perfect. And you're perfect the way that you are. You are a work of art. So am I. We're, we are works of art in the making. So the performing arts in Austin. The COVID pandemic has flatlined pretty much all of the performing arts. But guess what that let us be able to do? Figure out new ways to tell stories and perform and get the uh, get get our art out there. So what when we were normally on stages, we don't have audiences anymore. We've moved it to Zoom. We've moved um, where a lot of us are making more film than ever, which is really cool. You know, of course it's hard in the beginning as you're like, uh, I can't. I don't do computers. I can't do this. I'm not a 
I'm not a film actor, I'm a theater actor. You know, all of those resistances that you have when you can't do exactly what you want happen to a lot of us. And so we're all, we're all doing new things. I teach theater. I prefer to teach theater on a stage in, or in a classroom, you know, in person. But now I teach theater on Zoom. And wow, we didn't think it could work, but it's working. The, some of the same things translate. Memorizing a script, doing scene work, um, the you know, the feel of continuously performing something. So in a film, in film, um, it's all done in takes. So and you'll do a take over and over. You'll do a scene over and over until you get it right. And what that does to the actors is they're really good at that one scene, but they don't have the momentum of the entire story arc to get them through, which is really like really valuable for performing artists and artists. So it's all different. I mean, it's kind of just a different world. For dance, I've been leading improvisational dance on Zoom. And instead of, you know, hold, we can't touch each other, but we can certainly suggest that we're going, you know, we're holding hands or near, far, um, down low, you know, up high, you can still use the elements of design and dance, but you just got to get a little bit creative. Okay, so theater productions. There is a job for every artist in theater. Every artist has a job in theater. That's why I love it. If you are an actor, duh. If you're a director, duh. Costume designers, if you're uh, into, you know, soft sculptures, fabric, sewing, even if you don't really want to make the costumes, but you can design them really cool, like Kyle, his characters and those costumes are amazing. Now, he probably didn't want to go make them, but somebody else could make them. Somebody, you know, a sculptor or, you know, or a seamstress could make them. Um, graphic designers, who's going to make the poster? We got to have a poster. We got to have a flyer. You got to get the word out. Marketing is huge. If you just want to be, a, you know, you want to go study marketing and then be a part of a theater community. Why, why do people become, get into theater? They get into theater because they want to be a part of something. They want to be a part of something bigger than themselves. That's, you know, that's right here on earth, sharing, you know, caring, all, <laughs> all that. Why theater? Theater makes people feel. Film makes people feel. The performing arts make people feel. Your visual art also makes people feel. We feel things when we, when we are in the presence of art, we feel something. You may not know that you're feeling it. It may not resonate like mad, sad, glad, a frad. You, it's a subconscious feeling. It's, it's a feeling you don't even have language for because when you feel and you relate to something, there isn't, you may not have words. I'm a dancer and for a long time, I was incredibly scared of talking in public. I would like raise my hand. I was like, I'm gonna talk in class. I got something to say and it's good and it's smart. And then the lump would seize my throat and my body's like, don't you dare talk, you will die. And then, you know, all the fear, all the things. But what theater gives people the opportunity to do is per perhaps to overcome fear. So. Dancers, you know, dancers don't talk, they just move. That sucks. That sucks. I'm a teacher. I can't, I gotta talk. I gotta talk to you. I gotta share with you. And you gotta talk to me. And so doing, I branched out instead of doing just dance, I started to do theater and improvisational comedy. And wow, that broke me wide open. Telling story, making stories up on stage, so fun, so scary. But you kids, you do it all the time. I watch youth and teens all the time making up stories with each other. They're amazing. They're ridiculous. They have terrible endings, but some of them have amazing endings. It's, it's like something in our nature. It's something that we do. We tell stories. We love stories. Kyle loves stories. Sarah loves stories. Juliet loves stories. Juliet loves one particular story very, very, very much. And she, ha she has taught herself so many things based on this one world, this one story. And it's really cool. It's almost like 
art can't be taught because you have to teach yourself. You have to get in there and learn yourself and teach yourself. Okay, so the performing arts, I taught, we're all on Zoom, we're all doing these new things. Things are gonna start opening up. We're gonna start doing things in person. Totally Cool Totally Arts Theater program, which is now a multimedia program because we can't have an audience in person with us, is gonna be in person. We're gonna work video, we're gonna make videos, we're gonna you know, utilize broadcasting, OBS, um, Twitch, our, our screens, the rectangles, life in rectangles, let's just keep it going. But in person now, so we don't have to be, I don't have to be my own light. Like I've got this light set up. I've got a green screen behind me. I've got a, I've got so much tech in front around me and in front of me to make this look and feel good. But I had to set it up all myself. So now I'm a technician. So now I'm a lighting designer. I'm an editor. I'm a, I'm doing all, I'm getting all these skills and I didn't go out. I mean, I didn't know that I wanted them. You don't, you don't know what you want until you're getting it. And you're like, dang, I did want this. I wanted to learn this. I feel so, I feel so competent. Look at all I can do. All right, I wanna talk about, I wanna talk about you. Who wants to make money doing what they love, which I assume is art related, all of you. Wouldn't that be great? We love art, we love, we have these passions that we have, we wanna make money. We want to make money doing it. That's the dream. You know, parents that get mad at their kids because they're not doctors and lawyers, you got to figure out a way to sell your art and make your dream come true. And then your parents aren't going to worry about you. They won't worry about you when you're paying your rent and doing the, you know, doing what you love and you're happy and you're fulfilled. That goes out the window, right? So in order to sell your art, you have to be, you have to wrap your arms around being an entrepreneur an entrepreneur. Now, who does anybody think they're an entrepreneur? I certainly don't. I'm an I'm a dancer. I don't I can barely talk. How am I supposed to sell? What? Well, the business of selling your art is entrepreneurial ship. Okay, so a lot of you are solopreneurs, just you by yourself, slanging it, selling it. Got it. I sell dances. I'm a freelance choreographer. Okay. I make dances specifically for people's shows, their productions, their events, their parties, their weddings. Dance is such a part of everybody's culture. Even the puritanical culture still needs some dance. You know, Baptists are dancing now. It's amazing. Dance is so, it's so congruent to who we are. It's how we celebrate, it's how we worship, it's how we, you know, feel things it's how we express ourselves and dance doesn't have to be like this like ballet this perfect ballet or this weird abstract modern dance that nobody gets and nobody wants to go see or like musical theater that people are like half the people like it half the people don't like it because it's not realistic who's who just breaks into song and dance in the middle of their life i do i love it i say it. i do it why not so um, I sell the dances, I make them the dances and I sell them. I also, I didn't know that I wanted to be a freelance choreographer until I got into it, until people started to say, hey, will you make a dance for this? Will you come here and help my youth um, theater? I've got adult actors, you know, in this youth production and I wanna do some movement. So will you come and help us? Um, a lot of actors train in acting, but they don't train in dance. They don't, um, I, and that always, I was always like, what, why don't people do that? But theater is one thing, theater is one major, dance is another major, even though you'll be in the same college together on the same stages, you're not, you're doing two, you're in two different theories, two different paradigms. Hmm. Um, so once I started making dances for people, I really enjoyed going around to all the different organizations in town. I got to really like silo bust. I got to get out of my one little, like, all I do is TCTA and teach, you know, I'm just a teacher, I'm just an educator, and actually got to go and be a professional choreographer because all a professional artist is, is somebody that gets paid for what they do. So if you, if somebody pays you $5 to do a commission, you know, a little digital commission or, whatever, 
you're a professional. You're a professional artist. That's what it is. You get paid. You just get paid for what you do. It doesn't matter how much. That's it. Okay. And you put that on your resume. You want to build that resume with all the cool things that you do. Okay. So I'm out in the town. I'm out in the city of Austin. I'm making dances and I'm having the time. I'm just having the best time and I'm learning. And I, I end up with this organization called Body Shift. They are part of Art Spark, which used to be called Very Special Arts in um, Texas. Very, anyway, Art Spark now. And Body Shift is an it's an it's a group of dancers, movers that are all ability. So it's mixed ability dance. It's people in wheelchairs, blind, deaf. You know, um, you know, just pain dealing with a lot of pain that you don't see on the outside but you're feeling it that they feel it on the inside you know autoimmune diseases issues and then professional dancers are also in there as well so it's this beautiful space where pro professional dancers are dancing with um dancers that have mixed abilities and it's i'm just like this this is incredible this really this really resonates with me it really really resonates with me because i hate I hate it when people are like, I can't, I can't be a dancer. I can't dance. I'm not, I'm not skinny. I'm not white. I'm not tall, perfect. I, you know, all the things. And that's just shockingly untrue. It's really, it's really not, it's not real. We're all dancers. And if you want to be a dancer, you absolutely can. And here I am with body shift and I'm learning all these like cool improvisational tools with them. And all of a sudden I like have my why. I have, I got a why? I have a why. Wow. What is a why? That's your artist statement. That's what is in your artist statement that makes people resonate with you. They want to buy your work because they read in your artist statement, your why. And they're like, yeah, I want that. I want to feel that too. I believe what you believe. I want that. Come make something for me. I want to buy something from you. It's a feeling, it's a feeling, and it doesn't necessarily have language, but we have to put words to our why so that people can read it in our artist statements. It's really hard, but I er encourage you to take this time to think about your why. Why do you do it? So my why is, I think movement is medicine. I think if you move in ways that feel good to your body, you will feel better. What does feel better mean? Your, your psychological state will 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 feel a little bit better your body will start to feel better your body needs to be used you need to move it if it's if you don't move it you'll lose it you'll lose function and it's um not anything we really should want we want to be able to use our bodies till the very end of our life you guys you know you're lit you want to be lifting your equipment you want to be you know you want to be you want that trust and so to me, my why is I believe that if people move their bodies in ways that feel good, that's right for them, they'll begin to feel better, if not feel better, you know? And so for me, movement is medicine. So now that's what I do. So now I'm making dances that feel good for people. So I'm going to the children's theater. I'm going to Pollyanna Theater Company. I'm making dances that in my mind have fun movements that look cool, but are also good for the body. They do, they do a nice thing for the body. And so the, the dancers that are not, they're not real dancers, they're actors, they're non-dancers. So I have to, I'm making this dance for them. And I'm also teaching them how to dance at the same time. And I'm teaching them how to feel good about their body and space moving in ways that doesn't normally move at the same time. So I'm doing all this work that they don't even know about because it's like very deep subconscious stuff. And now I'm a scientist. I'm a scientist because I'm thinking about the brain. I'm thinking about the part of our brain, the limbic system, which is all about feeling. The limbic system is what moves our bodies. It's all the behavior, all the emotions, everything is the limbic system and there's no capacity for language. There's no talking in there, okay? It's just feeling, it's just moving. It's just moving and mirroring somebody and feeling like what it feels like. Ah. Can you picture what it feels like to move your arm? Close your eyes, everyone. Close your eyes. Think about your hand. Close your eyes and think about your hand. Okay. Let that go. Close your eyes and move your hand. Open and close your hand. Sense the way your hand feels. It's a different, it's a different perception. You're like, wow, that's way more interesting. Moving my hand and perceiving my hand moving is 
quite interesting and more interesting than just thinking about my hand. And that can happen for your whole body. You can you can trait you you can sense your body as it moves throughout your whole life, and it will give you a lot of good answers and a lot of good feedback. Okay, so I am now a scientist, an entrepreneur, an artist. I am making money at what I love to do. Is it a lot of money? No, but it's enough money to live. I am getting to teach teens about theater and dance. It's all, it's a journey. What I'm trying to say is it's a big, big journey. And you're gonna end up doing a lot of different things like, um, like Maya said, you're, you're gonna go from one thing to the next, to the next, and the next. It's like networking. You just, somebody gives you an opportunity, you go there. Like Kyle said, just do it. Just say yes and you'll figure it out. Jump out of the airplane. You'll figure out how to put the parachute together in the air and you'll be fine. And as long as you're kind and honest, you know, and ask for help and you don't, you'll be fine. You will be fine. And you'll make a life for yourself. And it will never change. You know, you'll never stop growing. You'll never stop learning all the way to your death. No, all, you know, to, to, for your whole life. So all that to be, all that to say right now is a time that we're all building resilience. We're all figuring it out. We're all leaving jobs to start new things. We're all trying to make art that's relevant to today. We're all dealing, you know, with, we're trying to be advocates and, and be good citizens. We're all, and that's a lot of resilience building, which to me, that just means be kind to yourself. Be, when you feel frustrated, when you get pissed off, when you're like, I'll never be able to, ah! I quit. When you're in that space and it's depressing and it's anxious, be kind to yourself sit with yourself. I know this feels terrible. This is really terrible. I do not like this, but it's going to be okay. It's temporary. You know, be kind to yourself, talk to yourself and you'll build resilience. You'll be able to start to like crawl back in and let it, and, you know, do the things that you love to do and remind yourself of your why come back to your why your why is why you do anything. You know, I'll never be able to dance with people in person again. I believe that moving is medicine. If you move in ways that feel good to your body, you will feel better. All right, let's get on the Zoom. Let's see what we can do. You know, you just, you talk yourself back into it when you know why you're doing it. And why you're doing it is probably not to get rich or to be famous, even though that's fun. It's not that, because that all, that's fair, that fades and becomes kind of terrible. But, you know, if you, if your why is really meaningful to you, then you will, you'll be fine. And your why can change, it can shift because what you do shifts and change, you know, you'll move from being a rock sculpture to be an architect, to, from being a modern dancer to being a um, filmmaker, you know, your, your what, what you do will change, but why you do it, it really shouldn't change too much. You know, it's, it shouldn't take, it shouldn't change too much. So all that to say, you're in a great place. You have everything you need. You have plenty of adults around you that want to help you. And so please reach out and ask. And we, cause we want to get you there. We, this, this Sarah, the teens, you guys, TCTA, we, we want to lift you up. We want to help you out and get you there. And so if you decide to go to college, you'll be, you'll have a, you know, you'll pick the college you want to go to. I highly recommend ACC, Austin Community College is amazing, amazing teachers in the arts, in visual art and jewelry making in or metal smithing theater dance amazing teachers and it's cheap it's cheap and it's amazing or go to scad go there it's amazing too amazing teachers an amazing facility with all kinds of cool stuff and you can get a scholarship ask for the money wherever you want to go wherever your heart pulls you do it and look for the awesome people and the awesome teachers that are that are there doing what you love and and be around them put yourself around the people that are doing what you want to do and it'll all rub off it's all it'll all you create a community right there of what you love i just gave you a ton i realized that and it is 157 do you, uh questions anybody have any questions or um, there was a question in the chat that says, what was your first experience of theater like? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so my first experience of theater, I 
my a bunch of people in my church i'm from a small town mount pleasant a bunch of people in my church were going to do were cast in fiddler on the roof at northeast texas community college and they needed like a couple of kids to also be in there so me and like deacons in my church like men that are like not not actor <laughs> we were all in this production of fiddler on the roof which is a incredibly heavy deep gorgeous musical and it it changed all of us it really i played like i pro played somebody's kid you know a man that i would be like kind of normally like kind of scared of and he's like my dad in this production i have to we have to be father and child so i just like shook me and i loved it and i never wanted i just wanted to be a part of this storytelling i love storytelling that's why i love theater I just, I love stories and stories happen in animation. They happen in film, they happen in theater. Your art pieces will tell stories. Helena's awesome murals, those animals tell a story. You can see, you can see it in their eyes. You can see it in their, in, in the way she draws their bodies. It's so cool. We're just, we're all humans that love stories and dig in. Absolutely. Does anybody have any other questions? Well, if you want to do, if you want to check it out, if you want to be a part um, of- I think I do. Okay, Jaden, yeah, what's up? So um, how is it like being like a scientist and an artist and, you know, how are you like studying all three? Dude, I just get up and whatever I want more of that day, I go find a podcast or I go find a YouTube video of, I'm like, I want some more brain knowledge. I want to know more about the brain. I want to know more, more about neurobiology and why we do what we do. Go, just go to YouTube or go, you know, search your podcast station. People are sharing all kinds of amazing information that's free. And it's so, so it's like, you can get what you want. You wake up one day, man, I just really want to dig into some Basquiat. I want to know about that guy. You just do watch some, watch some videos, get some information, let it resonate with you process it put it in your tool it's these are all tools for you you know you we take and borrow from all kinds of different from science from business from um film it's all it's all there for you to take and put in your toolbox and you and it you it comes out of your body it comes out of your body different that's why we're all different we all come up with different things so you're not you're you're never going to copy anybody don't worry you're when it comes out of you it comes out different So if you want to do some theater with us, and by theater, I mean, do you want to do some set design? Do you want to make some costumes? Do you want to learn editing? If you want to be a part of a program, multimedia kind of program this summer, come on down. I'd love to have you. Juliet and Jaden are awesome. We've got some great students that are all, they do all kinds of things. You know, very few of my students are like, I want to be an actor. I don't think anybody wants to do that anymore, but that's okay because we have plenty of jobs um but plenty of fun things to check out and you get to be a part of something bigger than you with a cool product at the end that you can all share Jaden, yes yeah? and so this is all online or is this in person great question we're going to be in person this summer two days a week or no three days a week we'll be in person at the asian american resource center and then two the other two days we'll do some we'll do it on virtual we'll do virtual still we'll still be on zoom for students that can't get down, you know, can't get to class in person, or it's just not not going to work for them. So we'll still do some Zoom stuff, which is really fun, and then we'll um, do set the in person. Okay, oh. and you'll send this information out as well. Yeah, we're. I'm going to have a flyer next week, and I'll email it to all y'all. I'll send it okay. out, and it's free. Free, no money. You get to keep what you make, and snacks, <laughs> and T-shirts. It's gonna be a cool T-shirt. I think that's the best part of moving back to in person is the snacks. The snacks. <laughs> that's right. Well, thank you all. Everybody was so great. All the in inspiring information and do reach out if you have any questions, kiddos. Reach out. Everybody here wants to help and would do anything to help you. So ask Yeah, about. absolutely. Thank you so much, Kelly. Very inspiring to not only the teens, but all of us as well, I think of the other uh, adult artists in the in the room Thank you, um, friends. it means a lot <laughs> i am gonna throw up one more poll it's a pretty oh. easy one 
And um, while y'all are kind of doing that, I wanted to just, again, thank everybody for showing up and also thank all of our speakers, uh, Helena, Kyle, Mai, and Kelly. Um, this was great. A wide variety of art forms and experiences and inspiration. Um, if anybody has any last minute questions, they can absolutely put them in the chat. We'll be on for just another minute or two. And then um, if you want to reach out to any of these artists individually, they, they had their, um, most of them had their uh, social media up there that you could message. Um, or if, if you go back to the event page, I believe it has all of it listed as well, if you want to reach out to anyone. Um, all right. Well, again, thank you. Oh, there we go. There's my putting it in the chat. All right. All right, well, since it's a beautiful Saturday afternoon, at least here in Austin, um, we're gonna let everybody go about their business for the rest of the day. Again, thank you to all of our speakers um, and thank you to, um, to all you teens that showed up. Um, Again, you can, you can check out our, our works in progress page if you're interested in our professional development program for next year. Um, you can look at the TCTA, Totally Cool, Totally Art page and see their um, camps they've got coming up this summer look amazing. So uh, we have all kinds of opportunities for teens um, with, parks, with Austin Parks and Recreation. So um, reach out if you wanna know anything more. Um, all right. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. Sarah. Thank you. Oh, and you also have like a link for this whole a website. What was your website? Um, it is uh, austintexas.gov slash works in progress. And I'll get okay. Kelly's I'll get Kelly that information too you, that she can give out to all okay, you. Okay, thank you. You guys should totally do this program. You too, Jaden and Juliet. I think it was probably yeah. really fun for the students that were there. And it, you okay. need, you'll hopefully we'll be in person next year and it'll be even, even more fun. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. All right. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your Saturday. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye, kids.